Um, hi, everyone. Um, so welcome to the Ad Hoc uh, Hack, uh, a live online workshop that is moderated and facilitated by CryptoChicks. Uh, the topics for today is uh, Crypto Economics for Plasma by Carl Flourish, a deployer on Plasma Chain. The workshop will last one hour. Um, you will have a 40 minutes lecture uh, by Carl and then 20 minutes QA after the lecture. Uh, you all will be on mute, but you will be asking the questions through chat. So there is a button um, at the bottom of your screen, the chat button, and you can ask your questions. Carl will answer it at the end of the workshop. So the workshop is about to start. Let's welcome Carl. So Carl, it's all yours. Hello. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I, you know, at some point we'll be able to talk and, and you won't be on mute and hopefully I'll see all of you at conferences or something like that. Anyway, let's dive right in. So um, I'm going to be uh, essentially showing y'all how to deploy your own plasma chains. Now, I don't know if everyone got the memo, um, but if you do have Node installed, um, I, I put together a little, uh, GitHub gist for us to, or for us to uh, essentially, you can follow and you can kind of like deploy your own plasma chain as I'm deploying my own plasma chain and going through kind of lectures that show how everything works. Um, so if, you know, this GitHub gist could be shared. Um, I just sent it to Elena, but I think it is, I'm only allowed to send Elena private messages. Um, at least that is, that's how it seems. So be how do I great it, hmm I think you sent it to me privately hopefully the chat stuff works but um, while that is getting figured out um, I will get get started so um, plasma group uh, you can you can actually check out uh, plasma group uh, plasma dot group this is a kind of open source project um, uh, Ben, Jing, Kelvin, myself have been kind of spearheading it, but it's a kind of community effort to create a plasma uh, implementation that everyone can use. So what is a plasma chain? Well, it is a non-custodial blockchain. Um, what does that mean? Well, um, it is secured. Why is it non-custodial? Well, it's secured by Ethereum the Ethereum main chain. And so Ethereum accounts retain custody of funds and it's secured by Ethereum's proof of work consensus. But, you know, don't trust me. You can check out some, some, uh, uh, the security assumptions here. Although actually don't go on that link yet because I have to fill it out. Uh, this was, you know, it will be, there will be a link to all of the security assumptions soon. Um, so anyway, here on the left, we see the Ethereum main chain. Um, by the way, please do send like messages and like ask questions. Um, personally, I feel like it'll be boring if I'm just talking to myself. I'm almost sad that I can't hear y'all voices, but it's okay. Um, anyway, so here's the main end. We have our, our miner and it's creating some blocks. And so everything is going well. And so in this context, Plasma will be secure. When the Ethereum main chain is secure, Plasma is secure. But if you know, Ethereum were to break, yes, Plasma's guarantees go away. Um, but hopefully that doesn't happen. And that is essentially you know, what Ethereum provides. If Ethereum was broken, then you know, there'd be a lot bigger problems than just Plasma being broken. So that if, if, there, if Ethereum is secure, that means Plasma is secure or these Plasma chains. And of course, there is the caveat where there is a extra synchrony uh, assumption with the plasma exit game which you can you can look into and I'm actually going to discuss later on so it's you know a little bit more uh, caveat a little bit more of a caveat this is true for for layer two solutions so it's an ethereum scaling solution really what it is what it is um, okay great uh, and there's and really it's 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 a blockchain scaling solution not just ethereum so there's you know many many plasma chains potentially and each one of them can scale you know actually larger than the ethereum main chain and so i can actually even you know talk about that later in q a or something but that is a lot of you know hocus pocus it probably feels like you know that's enough uh uh, uh magic uh 
technology that's indistinguishable from magic. So let's look at the actual code. So first, we are going to do four things. We are going to deploy a plasma chain, then we're going to deposit into the chain, then we're going to send a transaction, and we're going to talk about what if something goes wrong. So first thing we're going to do is npm install dash g plasma chain. So everyone who wants to follow along with me, please, please npm install. So I'm going to go into my terminal. I use tmux. Um, I'm also afraid that people are going to n learn about how I use my computer and then hack me. Um, so hopefully, hopefully no one, no one here who is watching is looking for security vulnerabilities. Please, please don't do that. Um, so anyway, I'm installing the plasma chain. So what does that do? You can also, by the way, install it locally. You don't have to do the kind of global NPM install. Um, that's kind of just up to you. Um, and so when it's finished, it will, it will, it will, you know, say so, and we'll go back there. Um, so let's see, it'll probably take a, another minute. So let's go over what our next step is. So first we're going to create a new account on the using in the like the plasma chain operator code. So just, you know, create account new. Um, and then it will, will add in a password and, you know, everything will be fine and dandy. So this is still going through. Um, and what will, what will happen is, well, I guess, I guess I'll just wait here, pause for a moment. Any questions so far? Um, actually, someone send a chat message generally. I'm curious if it actually works. Just say hi, and I'll shout your name out for, or not if you don't want. Testing, yay. How's it going, Goldman? Um, hey, hey, yay, a lot of people. Don't message, if you, you mess, someone messaged me privately, you might as well message it to the group. But anyway, okay, so it is installing. These crazy installation messages are because of Web3. Web3 is just kind of crazy, to be honest. Like, it has a lot of ridiculous dependencies that it does not need. Um, maybe, maybe. I, I, I shouldn't really talk anything about Web3. I haven't contributed to it. I should just fix it myself. Level DB, um, this is the database that we're, that we're using um, in the operator and also actually in the, the client and... Um, level DB is pretty great. It's it's what's used in Ethereum and a lot of Bitcoin clients. You know, it's it's just a, a staple in the industry. It's actually what is behind the browser um, database indexed DB, apparently, according to Stack Overflow questions that I've read. Um, now it is still installing. Do do do. And so many warnings. Promise you it wasn't my fault. Okay, so great. Plasma chain account new, just like I promised. Um, we are going to set a very secure password. It is test. Um, and then I'm going to send myself some ETH. So testnet ETH, this is very important. Um, I, I don't know if, oh, that is a very good point. I don't know if y'all have submitted your um, uh, addresses to this GitHub gist. Um, but hopefully you have, and I can send some people a bunch of testnet ETH and you can kind of like spread it around, hopefully. So I'm going to actually open up the GitHub gist, um, which has the kind of plasma workshop resources. Um, and so you, you have a link to all of the slides. This is what was in the chat. Um, the, you know, all of the different repos and the, the steps to follow and also just getting Rinkaby testnet ETH. So actually do, you know, submit comments here. Um, I'll actually refresh. Uh, submit comments here with your Rinkaby address and I'll just send people a bunch of Rinkaby ETH or you can get it on your own or you came with Rinkaby ETH, whatever. You know, help, help your friends out. Um, we're, we're all on the same team. Um, great. So uh, let's see. Da, da, da. Uh, account new, fantastic. And we are going to, I think that our transaction may have gone through, but we will have to check that. Da, 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 da. Ah, I should probably, I will retry with a higher gas price, although it looks like it may have gone through actually. Um, fantastic. Okay, so we have ETH. Now we are going to deploy a new plasma chain. Very exciting. So I'm going to call this plasma chain deploy and we'll go over what that is actually doing here. So um, in on the Rinkaby testnet, we have the plasma network registry. The plasma network registry has a, uh, uh, oh, so so I just got a question. Um, what is the testnet ETH going to be used for? It's going to be used to deploy a new plasma chain and also submit periodic blocks to 
to the Ethereum main chain. So essentially what that means is, you know, we need ETH for the gas to basically use the Ethereum main network. And that's what gives us our security. Otherwise, we're just like another lame old side chain. Um, so there is this plasma network registry. And what, we're, what we can see is we can actually go, there's a list of all of the plasma chains that have been deployed thus far. And if we call plasma chain list, we'll actually see this full list. So if I you know, were to go here, um, I will actually see the, the uh, uh, full list of plasma chains. So here, plasma chain list, and ba -ba -bum, we can see Da -da, a bunch of plasma chains. Actually, it looks like someone deployed a plasma chain just now. Um, and that list of plasma chains, we will also be able to create our own plasma chain. So if we run that plasma chain deploy command that I just did, it will create a signed transaction and it will mine on the Ethereum network. So this new plasma chain, we actually need to name, right? All of these plasma chains will get, get nice names. So, you know, workshop. Plasma. And we're going to set an IP address or host name. So this is actually important. Um, what our, one of our, the, the burner wallet, which we will set up soon, actually pulls the IP address from the uh, uh, registry. And so I'm actually going to set the IP address to my local host slash API so that the burner wallet will automatically connect. Um, we can, you can also change it inside of the burner wallet itself, but this is just the easiest way to go about it. Now note that, of course, no one else will be able to access my local host address, but other people will be able to, um, uh, you know, I will be able to use it and you will be able to use your own local host address. So now it is creating a, uh, uh, you know, this transaction and we can look at, oh, my telegram notifications. I will do not disturb y'all. Um, so the, da, da, da. okay, so now we are deploying this plasma chain, exciting, and it is, it is there. I didn't really call it my plasma, but you know, it doesn't matter. And we will call start. So right now, this, what, that, this first thing we'll do is we will call start. And so it's, it will take some time. I guess now is a good time for questions, more questions, um, so we run our ch plasma chains on Rinkeby and then it syncs with Ethereum mainnet or it syncs with Rinkeby mainnet. So yes, it syncs with Rinkeby at this moment. And this is because we do not want to, you know, put your funds at risk and uh, deploy a mainnet plasma uh, haphazardly. This is, this is, you know, against our caution, our better judgment. Um, any, any other questions? All right. Well, it looks like our plasma chain went through. Um, so let me, looks like our plasma chain went through. So we have our plasma chain address and our plasma registry address. Everything looks good. And we're going to call plasma chain start. So now this will boot up our plasma operator and we will start submitting blocks. So da, 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 it's already deployed. No block number found listening for transactions. So we have started our plasma chain. Great. Now uh, we are going to call test swarm. This is going to generate a whole lot of test transactions, send it to the operator. Those test transactions will be included in blocks and this will be done and, you know, just essentially show that the thing is working. So let's do that right now. Plasma chain test swarm. And da -da. here we are. So we are sending a whole bunch of transactions. Do, do. Weird. Interesting. Okay. So now we have a couple blocks of transactions. So let us deposit into the chain. Well, actually, before we do that, I'm going to uh, open up the Plasma Explorer. So I have already Git cloned a Plasma, uh, you know, block explorer. You can go on the, there's a re link in the, in the um, uh, workshop kind of materials. Um, and you can go into the Plasma Explorer and you can kind of like view your own Plasma chain from there. Um, so if I go into services uh, and client service, uh, then I can see that I set the, um, the address to HTTP localhost slash API. 
um, and now it will connect to my local host. So I can just run npm run serve and we should get our nice little, um, our nice block explorer. Um, and by the way, we have a block explorer which is already live on the Plasma group uh, website. This is just connecting to our Plasma chain. And in fact, it is already on block number 2,256, um, which is pretty, pretty ridiculously enormous. Um, most of these blocks, I confess, are empty. Um, and that is because, you know, we, we're, we, you know, we need, we need more, we need more people using these plasma chains basically, um, is what that means. Um, okay. So we should now have the block explorer up and running. So I'm going to, you know, ta -da! okay, we're on our fourth block and we have one block where we spammed a whole bunch of transactions and we got all these transfers, which is pretty cool, right? We can see Sue, who they're from and who they're to. Um, and we can, you know, do it a little bit more, get some more uh, transfers just so you can see. You can, you'll notice that I'm sending a whole lot of transactions. This, these are kind of just log messages. Um, and then at, periodically I'm going to generate a new block, which is essentially a Merkle tree. And so you'll actually get to see as these, you know, um, uh, the, the output of the logging as it generates a Merkle tree. So you know, sending transactions for block six and boom, now it is generating a new Merkle tree. So what is it doing? It's reading all the transactions from a transaction log and then it's writing them, it's hashing all of these transactions and then writing a tree to a database and processing all of the different children. So here we are, um, fantastic. Now, if I go here, I can see, da -da -da, we have a whole lot of transactions for that block. By the way, I think these transactions are in hex, so this is probably more than 348, um, probably more along the lines of 500 something. Um, so right now, Plasma, I just, got a, I just got a question, how frequently do Plasma blocks get committed? Um, they get committed currently at a rate of, I believe, 30, every 30 seconds um, by default. Uh, this is probably a little too fast. I would say like one minute is probably the most reasonable. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, either one, either one technically works. Um, it's just the more blocks you commit, the more you're going to be paying for gas and also the larger your history proofs will get. Um, so um, now what we're going to do is we are going to deposit or we are going to transact on this plasma chain. And so we're going to, you know, Alice goes onto this plasma network registry and sees, you know, this my plasma chain. But it'll, Alice will also see, you know, I love plasma, Pentagon, scale today, and exclusive P VI plasma. Um, and so... Uh, I heart plasma Pentagon and scale today are all plasma chains that have, you know, been deployed technically already. Um, by the way, most of these plasma chains that have been deployed have not really submitted any blocks. So, you know, caveat there, this is still early days. Um, and a v exclusive VI plasma is just to show that these plasma chains actually, they can have their own rules with regards to what transactions they accept or do not accept. So, Alice needs to choose between them and, you know, Alice might choose this one, this one, or, but can't choose this one because, you know, maybe it requires KYC, something like that. So Alice will instead choose my plasma um, and Alice will uh, start to submit a deposit. So what we're going to do is we're going to start a burner wallet, which will point at our plasma chain. So, um, I already set this one up, and so if I just do npm run serve, it should actually connect to my local host plasma chain, um, and we will watch that as it happens. Um, da -da -da. And let's see if it's done. Haha, -ha, it has finished. Okay, so now we can look at all of these fun logs once again, connected to plasma chain Ola. Technically, it's a different plasma chain name, but it's both pointing at local host. So. It works. Oh, great. Successfully connected to operator. That's what we wanted to see. So now I'm going to take this address and I am going to send it some ETH. Um, 2.1. Uh, okay. Um, and I'm also going to really quickly take a look at our thingy. Make sure that if there's anyone who commented who wants Rinkaby ETH. Wow. No one wants Rinkaby ETH. 
that is, I'm, I'm glad that you're, you're all Rinkaby Wales. Um, so um, now let us see. Ta -ta. Okay, so I'm still waiting to receive my ETH. Okay, I have received it. And actually what I need to do, I, I, I have to uh, clear this because I would be cheating. I already have some plasma ETH on this wallet, but I haven't, uh, I, I, you know, haven't cleared my, my database. So let me just quickly delete my database and restart it. So I, I uh, get a new, new wallet. You can actually also burn your key here, but whatever. Um, okay, so let me, let me send it some, some, some ETH. Um, here we go and 0 0.1 and let's give it a nice high gas price all right coolio and so soon this will go through um ta -ta. so what we're going to do is we're going to deposit and send this ethereum transaction right it's an ethereum transaction remember to our plasma contract the settlement contract and now the plasma the settlement contract is going to you know it will receive all of this 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 eth once we've deposited it right now we're just kind of sending it to the the uh, the user but once once the plasma uh, contract gets the eth we are going to, you know, subtract it from whatever account we're using, uh, you know, Alice's account, and then add it to the Plasma Contracts account. And so that deposit will be recorded in the smart contract. And that will kind of create a virtual block. It will create a record of the deposit right here. And it will increment um, Alice's PETH amount, you know, Plasma ETH amount by whatever amount she deposited. Um, and so let's see if we've received our ETH. In fact, we seem to have, we seem to have received our ETH. It seems great, great. Now we will deposit. So I'm gonna just deposit a thousand. We're, it says ETH right now. This is just kind of uh, a little bit of trickery. It's really way. Um, it's not a thousand ETH. I wish I, wish I had that much Rinkaby ETH. Um, great, so now we have a thousand ETH. It has shown up on the plasma chain. This is pretty cool. Um, and I'm pretty glad that no, you know, nothing went wrong thus far. Pretty great. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up another wallet so that I can send to a friend. But let's, let's see. Send a transaction. So let's, let's do that. Um, so instead of just Alice, that would be pretty boring if the plasma chain was just Alice. So instead we have Bob as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to send some plasma ETH and that will generate a plasma transaction. And that will, you know, we'll send that to the operator. The operator will sign it and Merkleize it. Um, what Merkleizing, you know, it, essentially what it will do is it will create a compact block commitment. So this means that it is a fixed length number that can allow us to prove inclusion as well as actually exclusion um, of a set. Um, so we have our element and we have this fixed length commitment and with a witness, we can prove inclusion or exclusion. Um, and this is what allows us to store very small amounts of information on Ethereum while uh, uh, also providing the ordering guarantees of the transactions. So you can prove that your transaction was included without storing everything on the Ethereum chain, which is great. But note that if the block has been, you know, Merkleized, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has been committed. And so we need to wait until it is mined by Ethereum. Fantastic. Now it's committed. And what we can do is we can, you know, uh, we will, we can get our transactions. This is actually what's happening um, is it's calling get transactions on the operator. And then it's going to receive the history of the uh, transactions, which it has sent, you know, Alice has sent. And then it will also receive the, um, Hist the history proof of the uh, or the full uh, uh, Ethereum chain records of the blocks. And so it will validate um, each block individually. It will say, okay, I got the deposit transaction I'm, and I also uh, got the Ethereum or the Plasma block commitment. Um, so I just got a question, uh, which is what's the difference between Plasma cash and Plasma chain? Oh, Fun. Um, so really the full thing that you might say is like, this is a plasma cash chain. Um, so essentially, right, these plasma cash 
is a design pattern for how to structure the blocks um, to get particular guarantees um, with plasma chains. Um, and this is something that, you know, maybe has confused a lot of people because there've been a lot of random terminology. We're trying to kind of move away from these random words and we're just going to be like, okay, you know, here, this is, this is a plasma implementation. And this is, uh, in particular, this is a plasma implementation, which is, you know, somewhat general in that you can actually, you know, have potentially, potentially many different kinds of plasmas. Um, plasma uh, 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 design patterns in the same kind of network, which would be very cool. Um, so this will then, uh, once we have validated the history, we will be able to update the block. So back to the sending transactions. Once we have validated the history, we'll be able to update the actual balances, right? We minus 50 from Alice and send 50 to Bob. And remember, don't trust verify, um, right? This is, this is not, we are not trusting that the plasma operator is doing the right thing. We're not trusting uh, anything outside of the security properties of the main Ethereum chain, as well as our ability to be online to make sure that you know, we can resolve disputes, um, which I will, I will discuss. So um, now we have this 100, uh, uh, this 100 coins in, the, uh, in our like, this is essentially like Alice, um, Alice's wallet. Um, but now what we also want to do is we want to mess around with, with uh, Bob's wallet. So let's go to localhost 8080. I believe it's 8080. Um, nope, that is the block explorer. So 8080801. Um, and what we will do is we will say, okay, um, first I need to burn key. Two, two. And great. So now, um, actually, let us just... Or you know what? I can do localhost. Oh man. Uh, sorry, one moment. Application, delete database. Great. All right. Um, so now I have this. Um, I actually do have some normal ETH, but I don't have any uh, plasma. That's not ETH. Or a plasma path. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send to this account. So I'm going to send, you know, 100 PETH to this account. And then it will, you know, show up right here um, over in Plasma Balance 100. There we go. So, and we actually have a pending withdrawal, which is interesting. Um, so great. We have sent to Bob. Very fun. Um, so what if something goes wrong? This is, this is kind of like where, where the rubber hits the road with regards to security. So, you know, right now the plasma operator is being run by me. Everything's fine, right? These blocks are being committed without a problem. I have not modified the code at all. Um, however, this is not always the case. You don't necessarily know who is creating your blocks. And so they may go rogue and they may create an invalid block. So this is an invalid block with Alice sending the operator, you know, 50 ETH, for instance. Um, there's a transaction included in this block, which is invalid. The signature does not check out. And we've got a problem here. So according to this block, Alice's balance is zero. But we already know that Alice should not have this tiny little balance. Um, now, uh, the, ah, so I actually just got a question. This is uh, to even may pull, pull us out a little bit, but um, when I tested the transactions and I looked at this block explorer, you'll notice that it didn't include the, the, uh, uh, the deposit blocks. Um, and the reason why it doesn't include the deposit blocks is actually, I, I confess, the deposit blocks are a kind of um, uh, uh, metaphorical, uh, uh, or it's not something that is included in the actual data structure of the smart contract. And so it's not shown in the same way. Instead, we differentiate between the deposits and the transactions in our actual implementation. But for this kind of, uh, uh, when you show, if you were to show everything together, it makes sense to show everything in a kind of blockchain structure because really what's happening is we have a deposit and then we have a transaction. And so it needs to be ordered in this way. So we, it's, it makes sense to show it in this chain, but it's just how we display it more generally. Um, so we are now in the case where 
you know, back to back to the, the main show. We're now in the case where the plasma operator is being malicious and included an invalid transaction, uh, sending away Alice's money. And so we can't have this happen. This is just absolutely ridiculous. And so what do we need? Dun, 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 dun. We have the settlement contract. They're going to save the day. Our friendly robot smart contract. Remember, it's deterministic. Um, which means that it's not it's not a it's not a judge in the subjective sense that we think of maybe in our court system. Um, so Alice signs a message saying, "Give me my ETH," because you know the operator is gone gone rogue, and so that's included in the Ethereum chain. And now the exit contract or the the settlement contract will say, "Exit initiated. Please submit evidence if this is disputed." So the operator, if the operator, you know actually had submitted a real transaction of Alice's, maybe Alice would have been lying. But in this case, Alice is really not lying. And it is actually the fact that this is Alice's money. And there is no evidence which the operator is able to submit to disprove Alice's claim. And so we wait some period for the evidence to be provided. And then the contract will make the judgment. Yes, this is indeed Alice's money and send her 50 ETH. So now the balance of the operators or the, the balance of the settlement contract has decreased by 50 and Alice has increased. And the operator has not gotten anything. Good, success, attack failed. But there's more. Let's try that again, just for fun. Um, seven days later, right, this is uh, quite a long time. Um, we can do a couple things to actually mitigate this, this time, time period. One thing we can do is Alice, immediately after submitting that exit, can prove that she actually owns the coins and you know, receives some ETH. Someone may buy her exit from her and send her ETH on the main chain. But another thing Alice can also do is not just say, give me my ETH, but also migrate me to a new plasma chain. Basically, change my operator. I don't like this guy anymore. I want to use a different operator. And Alice can submit that transaction to the main chain. And what, that, what the, the smart contract will say is, sure thing, what chain would you like to switch to? Well, thankfully, we have this nice plasma registry for with all of these different chains that we can potentially switch to, right? Pentagon, scale today. Scale today doesn't really look very trustworthy. Look at that snake. Oh my gosh. Um, so Alice chooses Pentagon. Um, and so the contract is like done. All right, you can do this. Um, now, note that this transfer is still going to, there's still going to exist this seven day dispute period. However, Alice can immediately start sending transactions to Pentagon. And what users on the Pentagon chain will do are, will simply check the transaction history. They'll just check to see that, val that the transaction history is in fact valid. They will ignore this block because Alice is moved on to the Pentagon chain and they will be able to accept Alice's transaction. So even if something were to go wrong, Alice is, you know, doesn't have to suffer a large disruption in her service, which is really quite a cool feature. It, it, it basically shows this kind of interconnectedness of all of these different chains. So what did we actually do as a little review? Well, um, we deployed a large number of chains and they all were deployed in the same kind of like network interconnected -y thing. Um, and we actually have already had about 40 uh, chains deployed onto the testnet, um, which is, uh, you know, pretty cool. Most of them, albeit, are empty and maybe half of them are de deployed by us. But nonetheless, it's pretty easy to deploy, as I have just shown. I just added, it should be 41 now, right? Um, so... Next, we've also deposited into, into the chain. Um, right now, it's Ethan ERC-20s, but ERC-721s are, are you know, built in, basically. And the, uh, uh, technically, any state could be deposited in if you design your exit game properly. So this is really about thinking about Plasma as a general framework. Um, and uh, uh, great. Um, so someone is unable to install Plasma chain. Um, happy to, you know, either submit a GitHub issue or, you know, let's, uh, you, we can debug it at, at a later um, time. Um, and then uh, send a transaction. So we can also um, send transactions. Uh, we just, you know, showed the transactions per second is not limited by the root chain because of these compact commitments. Um, and actually, we're, you know, able to get some really good uh, transactions per second already. Um, and users' funds are safe, assuming the root chain is not compromised and there is someone online to detect cheating. 
pretty great, pretty great. So um, that is the kind of like meat and potatoes of, of what we've, we've done. We essentially, you know, we deployed everything. We, you know, deposited, sent a transaction, and we're, we're pretty set. Um, but now a few fun topics to discuss. Um, first, you know, maybe any, any questions on this, please feel free to, feel free to ask. Um, and then I'll just start talking about, you know, uh, just fun, fun things. So like penalties for malicious behavior. Um, so I'll start going in and feel free to kind of pull me out. Great. Um, I think I missed it. Someone explain why we burn the key first. Ah, so don't, you don't need to burn the key. Um, the, Issue was that I had used the burner wallet um, previously, and I had connected the burner wallet to my local uh, plasma chain. And the burner wallet will actually store your uh, transaction history uh, in it, right? So it'll store your balances, it'll store all your kind of information. So if you destroy the plasma chain, as I did just earlier, because I was testing out this live demo, um, then what will happen is you'll, you may need to, I, I, I had to remove my database and then reinstantiate it so that it would pull the new information from my, from my thing. Um, so uh, now uh, some, some penalties for malicious behavior, some fun, fun little design, design things. So, right, like this, this kind of idea of, of kind of constraining the uh, actors, the, the people who are working for you, being, I'll be like either the validators or the operators or any party, you know, constraining what they can do to only be something that your protocol supports and believes in. So like this is a design principle that carries on throughout Casper, throughout Plasma, throughout a whole bunch of these crypto economic mechanisms. Um, now, one of the cool things you can do is you can say, okay, well, if the operator were to allow an invalid exit, which is later proved by the settlement contract, then you are actually able to just shut that operator down. So that means that even if the operator doesn't have an, uh, you know, a bond, which they can, they can say, I bet uh, $1,000 that I won't um, be able to, that I won't an, allow an invalid exit. And if you're, if you're, if you're fault, if you're found out to be, be lying, then you get your thousand dollars slashed, but you can also just shut down the operator and allow users the opportunity to switch what chain they're using. Um, and these, these, uh, uh, you know, transfers can actually be done in a relatively compact way based on the plasma cash flow design patterns. Um, and so, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, Basically, this is a pretty, pretty cool property. Um, so I just got another question. Um, so on the Plasma chain, we interact with the EVM, but it, with Plasma Ether. When we're done doing our business in the Plasma chain, we can find out the final balance of Ether in the Plasma chain and post it on the main chain. Yes. So that is essentially it. You're, you're able to like deposit your ether into this plasma chain. You, you know, do some business logic, high transactions per second, whatever it may be. And then eventually you can pull it out onto the Ethereum main chain and, you know, uh, transact with it there. And the security of your, of your, you know, ether that's on the pl plasma chain and on the main chain is actually very similar as, as long as you make sure that you are online or you trust the operator to not allow uh, invalid exits, which I personally, you know, don't want to rely on. But what we just talked about with this, this um, invalidity is proven, the auto they're automatically replaced, it actually does mitigate the damages. So if one person gets, gets uh, you know, harmed by a, a malicious operator, at least you won't be able to also have your money stolen. Um, so that should be a little bit of consolation. So, so essentially, and you can also, even, even if you don't, you, you can get it back on the main chain, you can transact it there. You can even transfer it to another plasma chain and transfer and transact it there, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, why do we need Polkadot slash Cosmos is if all custom chains opt for plasma? Um, it's a good, good question. Um, I would, I mean, <laughs> I would say that Plasma is a legitimate, very good option for a lot of the kind of, I want to deploy my own uh, uh, blockchain kind of uh, people. And, and, you know, there's very legitimate reasons to do this. Um, and so uh, I would say that maybe one of the, I guess, downsides of Plasma um, that, you could, uh, that you could say is that um, Plasma exit games are somewhat complex to reason about and uh, uh, implement and deploy at the current at, at this moment. So I actually have a little challenge here, right? Exit games are complex to reason about. 
Um, and so that makes it a little bit difficult to, you know, implement your business logic on a plasma chain. But if your business logic is well suited for a plasma chain, which means, you know, maybe it only requires, you know, simple sends and atomic swaps, or maybe you're just, a, you know, uh, an exit game guru and you're able to code in some kind of arbitrary, uh, complicated state uh, transitions, then, you know, maybe plasma is actually a better, probably more secure solution. Um, so now, uh, let's see, let's see, where was I? Um, atomic swaps on the uh, plas across chains. So one of the coolest things that I did not realize about Plasma until very recently was that all of these Plasma chains happen to be connected in a very fundamental way. Um, that means that atomic swaps are actually able to be performed natively between chains, between these operators, right? So, so what that means is because you're using the same Ethereum main chain, you're able to submit these, you know, enter into which is what is effectively like state channels on, to, on the Ethereum main chain. And it doesn't matter what plasma chain you're running, you can do this and you get kind of native guarantees. So if it's, you know, within a single plasma chain and you're doing an atomic swap or across plasma chains and doing an atomic swap, it actually um, behaves very similarly. Um, and this actually just applies for, for state channels more generally. So, so all of these, these chains, you, you can kind of think about them as like operators that are submitting blocks and kind of deploying a new chain, but you can also think about it as, you know, you are uh, uh, delegating an authority to essentially take a, a bunch of these um, like off chain messages and compress them into a single commitment on chain and then put it on chain. And then once you have that commitment on chain, it doesn't matter who made the commitment as long as it has been made. Um, and that allows us to essentially like use the main chain, the, the interoperability of the main chain. We know that smart contracts on the main chain interop perfectly. We can use that same interoperability, but we can use it between all of the different people who are scaling using all of these different operators or committers or whatever you would want to call them. And remember, they're all non-custodial, right? So there's no, you're, you're not trusting anybody, um, which means that you can just go on a, a long list of these, these committers or operators and uh, choose one and send your money there and be more or less secure that, or say, uh, uh, confident that your funds are safe. Um, now, something that I often get asked, okay, like is CryptoKitties possible on a Plasma chain? And so there's a big caveat here where it's like, okay, I haven't yet implemented it and I don't have a full specification for it. Um, and so this is actually like one of the, one of the questions like, okay, um, you know, is, is, is Plasma the right solution for something like a, a CryptoKitties? Um, I believe that it is in fact possible. And this is not something that I actually knew how to do until pretty, pretty recently, or, or at least believed I know how to do until pretty recently. Um, and essentially what this means is you have the ability because you have the main chain to design your own exit games. You'll notice that I didn't go into the specifics of the exit game, which we use in this test net. And that is because that exit game, while it is incredibly, you know, cool and it allows for light clients and it has all these properties that we really like, you know, you can read up on the exact specification on, you know, medium.com slash, uh, plasma group uh, spec, plasma spec. So like this, this will give you a full kind of overview of the technicals of what we built. Um, and by the way, just quick shout out to, uh, and, and so, you know, Ben Jones, who's actually, I think on the call, um, you know, wrote this up um, and with, you know, with the help of the rest of the team as well. And by the way, also shout out to Kelvin um, and, uh, you know, Jing for, for Kelvin doing the burner wallet and the Explorer and Jing for designs and a million other things. Um, anyway, sorry, that was a little random shout outs section. Um, but back to CryptoKitties. Um, so proofs of validity can be done with snarks and starks. So we, what we can do is we can say, you know, what is the essence of CryptoKitties? For instance, you're like mixing coins and then minting them uh, uh, deterministically off, off chain. And, you know, this mixing can potentially be proven uh, using Starks. 
Um, and there, you know, you can also use other forms of validity proofs and you can also just, you know, use centralized minting. This definitely works, right? So this is, this is actually already very cool. So think about it as like, okay, I'm a video game developer. I want to, um, you know, have a video game world where I'm minting a thousand new assets every hour, right? There's a lot of people playing my world of Warcraft clone and, you know, they're, they all want to be trading their their uh, swords with each other and across plasma chains and you know they want all these cool features and they want to put their swords in state channels and you know make them all based on derivatives from the die uh, uh, CDPs right so like this is and this is like actually you know things that can happen and are kind of insane and they can happen with high transaction per second right they can happen high throughput um, and so like this is actually pretty cool. And centralized minting, by the way, one thing is like, you know, you can imagine that every mint has a unique uh, ID. So like, you know, basically it's like the, the, the Nike shoes that were created in 1992, the originals are worth way more than the Nike shoes that were created in 2019. Um, so uh, some challenges. I already kind of went over these. Um, you know, these exit games are a little bit complicated to reason about. Um, however, we, we, one of these challenges, you know, may have a bit of a mitigation where we, it would be really nice to have an exit game or a state channel simulator um, where we can kind of like verify the, the validity of these uh, exit games and kind of like prove, maybe have some, some, some things that make it easier to formally verify properties of our exit games. Um, and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm currently working on a, like a very basic simulator, but this is just the beginning. Um, and I believe that if, you know, if the tooling gets good enough, um, then we should be able to get very, very complicated uh, 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 exit games and state channels more generally and, and just basically, you know, continue to expand the features that are possible with these plasma chains. Um, it's really important to have extensibility for this stuff. It's really important to allow, you know, everyone to kind of build on top. Um, and so that's, that's what I think that this is, you know, this can enable. Um, the other thing is, you know, yes, we have a slow main chain. Um, uh, you know, the Ethereum chain currently processes like 14 transactions per second. Um, this is, in fact, it is questionable whether or not this is good enough or not good enough. I don't actually know yet. I haven't really, I, I really should do the math. Um, but essentially, in the, in the optimistic case where everything is going nicely, no operators are misbehaving, all the state channels are, you know, going great, then the main chain currently as it stands today is more than enough to support a huge amount of plasma, you know, traffic. And in fact, in it, like an obscene quantity to the point where it actually like, you know, scaling is like a given. Um, but the question is, okay, how much malfeasance, how, how many bad things will happen? Um, is the main chain capable of processing all of these disputes? Um, and, you know, we'll see. Um, and Ethereum 2.0, it will certainly be enough to process all these disputes. But even in Ethereum 2.0, we are going to need solutions like this plasma stuff. Um, so uh, I just got a, a fun question. So uh, if I build a game where I expect high number of transactions per second, I should build it first on Plasma slash Rinkeby. Um, so realistically, you should, you know, you should one, definitely build it on Plasma. Um, that is, you know, a, a, like basically a perfect fit um, because it means that your game assets will not actually have to touch the main chain. Um, and it also means that your, um, uh, uh, you know, at running an operator, you will have pretty good guarantees uh, about the, um, you know, uh, availability of your operator, right? You have a good incentive to keep your operator running because you're running your video game. Um, so that's, that's great. And so benefits, scaling today, right? <laughs> that is a pretty enormous benefit. Um, and yes, currently it is on Rinkeby, but it is, uh, you know, I think uh, it goes without saying that this needs to be on mainnet. Um, and that is incredibly important. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that, love knows no borders, my corny slides, these are my corny slides. Everybody, you know, share your knowledge. I'll try to share my knowledge. I'll, you know, uh, do the best I can. Hopefully, hopefully you do too. Thank you so much. Shout out to cryptoeconomics.study. Shout out to Plasma Group, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's mostly it. Uh, there's like 10 minutes technically if y'all want to ask questions. Um, no, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer. You, you have my undivided attention for, for the next while.
Um, great. So what kind, what projects? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, oh, yes. The, the, definitely check out the Telegram group, um, Plasma Contributors. Um, definitely check out Plasma Group generally. Um, dot group, right? Go there without a doubt, please contribute to the GitHub. This is a community effort um, and all that. Um, and there was, there was a question, what projects are currently built, being built on Plasma? Um, and uh, right now there's a bunch of projects that have kind of said stuff like, you know, for instance, Grid Plus recently in their, in their blog post uh, uh, mentioned Plasma as a scaling solution. Um, there's projects that we're in talks with that really, you know, need to scale. Uh, and it's actually hilarious that, you know, basically a huge number of Ethereum projects are like, oh my gosh, we all, we need to scale now. And uh, we, ha we really can't wait for, for anything. Um, you know, can't wait for, you know, Ethereum 2.0, I need it now. Um, and so like, you know, this is definitely something that is, is for a shorter time frame. Um, and in fact, it, it is for a shorter time frame, but it is also here to stay for the long term, um, just because this is a good design pattern for building scalable uh, decentralized software. Um, and yeah, uh, any, any more questions? Uh, okay, guys, so while you're thinking on the questions, uh, so let me uh, uh, tell you about the, our next workshop. So first of all, it was a great today workshop. Uh, so if you want to review Carl's workshop, uh, please visit epcon.io slash hackathon. So we will upload the video there. So you will see uh, all the details all over again. Uh, please, if you didn't sign up for the hackathon, sign up at uh, epcon.io slash hackathon again. And right now also I will post some information about the next workshop. Uh, in, in group chat. Uh, so the next workshop will be uh, at 19.30, which is 7.30 Sydney, Australia time on February 15th. So February 15th, it will be practical ZK Snarks constructing for Ethereum using Rust, Bellman and uh, Gadget Library. And that will be uh, run by Alexander Vlasov uh, from Russia. Uh, so for this workshop, it will be a practical webinar and we'll focus on the practical aspects of uh, how people can write a uh, primitive circuit and test it using a Bellman and the gadget library. Uh, also, I will just uh, post some links for you to pre-study for this workshop if you're interested. Um, and again, uh, register for the hackathon at epcon.io slash hackathon. Uh, I will post all this information right now in the chat. Uh, please, uh, ask your questions from Carl, uh, that would be great time right now. Cool. Um, these workshops are great. Go EdCon. Um, anyway, um, I, I got another question. Uh, we'll go for, I'll go for another, you know, eight minutes or so. I got another question, another versus questions versus proof of authority networks um, with a little smiley face. Um, sounds like a knowledge, someone who knows, knows the, their question is fun. Um, so proof of authority networks have a entirely different trust model, right? So, so you're, you're really trusting that the authorities, right? The people who are running the full nodes or the validating nodes of your proof of authority network are uh, going to have your, you know, your thoughts in their best, or you in their best interest. Essentially, what that means is they can basically do anything. Um, there are things that you can do, like you can essentially, uh, uh, they can, uh, how do I say this in a, in a nice, nice way? Um, they can, you know, rewrite history, they can censor your transactions, they can, uh, they get basically full control. And what you're trusting, the only difference between a proof of authority network and like Google, for instance, Google is almost like a proof of authority network, is that you have in a proof of authority network, you have multiple authorities potentially. And you maybe have, uh, you know, some rationale for why all of them won't cooperate with one another. Um, however, there are actually some benefits, right? Depending on how you uh, create your proof of, proof of authority network, you can actually build things into it that does make it more secure. So like you can make it easy for users to prove that there was something that went wrong, right? So that is a, an advantage of a proof of authority network over something like, you know, Google, which makes it quite probably would make it quite hard for you to, you know, prove that they, they, you know, uh, with, uh, 
deleted all of your, your Google pay money or something like that. Um, and so like you can have, uh, this, but, uh, this property, but it is very different from the property that, you know, if the operator were to do anything wrong and by the way, the proof of authority network could be a plasma chain itself. And then it gets the really good properties that plasma chains have. Um, then what happens is you can, you know, you can go back onto the main chain or you can switch your operator to a different operator. Um, and all of this is, you know, uh, just really, like, at least in my opinion, much more decentralized, much more secure than proof of authority. Um, so I got another question. Can you talk about the current state of range payments, frag, defrag, um, what's implemented currently, currently, what are the limits, et cetera? So what's implemented currently, I probably should have gone over this earlier, is we have simple sends and we also have multi-sends, which means that we do have atomic swaps baked into our current design. Um, what does that mean? That means that we're able to, uh, you know, take, you know, I sign a message which says I'll uh, exchange these coins for these coins and then, you know, we swap ownership only if both of them sign off on it. Um, so that's really, that's really very useful. And that actually um, has to do with this thing called, you know, range payments and fragmentation and defragmentation. So this is a more technical thing that hopefully users won't have to really think about too much. Um, and that is that the current way that we achieve light client support or really just client support that is, that is uh, uh, very, very efficient is we are able to make the, the, um, the client only download uh, the transactions, sorry, the client scales logarithmically when uh, with the number of transactions and the operator scales linearly with the number of transactions. What does this actually mean? Well, it means that the client only needs to download um, their own transactions, proofs of their own transactions and proofs of their own transactions exclusion. Um, and it's logarithmic in the size of the number of transactions because essentially what you're doing is for every block, you're downloading the particular part, part of the block that you care about. Um, what that what that really ends up meaning is that uh, it has it has one really nice benefit, which is that clients don't have to be very large and operators can be massive. So you can definitely have a client that, you know, is on a connected to a plasma chain network that is processing 100,000 transactions per second. That's like not a problem at all. The client can totally keep up with that um, as long as the operator is implemented in a scalable way, which you know, a lot of exchanges do process 100,000 transactions per second. Um, the annoying side effect of that is that now you have to think about uh, all of these coins as being essentially NFTs. So there's a, you basically have a, a very large amount of NFTs and they're all on this kind of like number line. And what you're doing when we say range payments is you are pay, you're spending a range of coins, which means if I want to send you one, uh, you know, 0.5 ETH, then I might send you NFT number 100 through 150. Right. And what that would actually equal out to, you know, each one of those NFTs is, you know, 0 0.01 ETH, then it all equals out to 0.5 ETH. And so what, what this, this kind of does is that um, if you want to exit those funds, then you need to, you'll exit it in a range. So you'll say, I'm going to exit or transfer, uh, uh, you know, coins 100 to 150. And that can be very succinctly stated. Um, but if you own coins 100 to 150 and then coins 500 to 550, then that means you have to exit two different coins. That's where defragmentation comes in, right? Your coins exist on two parts of this number line and you really want them to exist all in one big chunk so that you can exit all of your assets simultaneously. Um, what do we do for this? Well, it's actually pretty simple. All we do is we say, okay, operator is a perfect person to suggest Defra or fragmenta uh, defragmentation requests. So essentially what the operator will do is the operator will say, oh, this user has these funds and this other user has these funds. Well, let me just say, okay, I'm going to send a message to both of them and I'll say, okay, why don't you guys swap so that now one user has these funds and the other user has, you know, this uninterrupted segment. Um, this is a very, you know, uh, this essentially allows you to, you know, exit on, uh, you know, a larger set of coins. And so this is kind of being done, at, at, you know, as time goes on. Um, 
However, the basic idea or the hope is that this stuff will happen in the background and people don't actually have to know, you know, that their, you know, coins are fragmented or getting defragmented and the, uh, you know, their, their, their stuff is fragmented along this like virtual space of numbers, right? Like that, that's some crazy stuff that users, developers, it's like, you know, if you get into the weeds, maybe you know, but you don't have to. Um, and that's kind of what we're shooting for. We're definitely trying to make sure that like um, you get scalability um, and you don't get the, the, the um, downsides of, you know, whatever weird design choices that, that, require, that are required for scalability. Um, so that is, uh, that, is, that is pretty much that. There's actually been a whole lot of thought that has been put into these range payments, that has been put into the format of the blocks, that has been put into all of this. So really do check out the specification. Also check out, uh, stay tuned for you know, what we come out with next. We've just made like leaps and bounds in terms of research. Uh, it's been you know, a, a whole lot of fun. Um, and I'm really you know, quite excited to, to scale, scale Ethereum um, and blockchains more generally, because this is really just, this is just cool tech overall. So anyway, it's 4 p.m. It's probably, probably good for me to stop ranting. Um, pretty sick of my voice. So um, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, you, uh, again, register for the uh, hackathon at edcon.io slash hackathon. And this workshop was brought to you by Carl Flourish and also CryptoChicks facilitated it. Thank you very much. Recording will be available. Thank you, thank you. And goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>